set the tone for the rest of the day. So if you're still feeling sleepy, shake it off. Hey everyone, as you can see we are on the peak of a mountain and this is not a mod and this is not just a map that is custom made, this is natural generation and I must say it looks pretty nice. So yeah, this is a new beta that recently released and it is the cliffs part of the caves and cliffs, well, update that is coming to Minecraft and yeah, this is on bedrock. So I thought that I would just make an overview of the more recent caves and cliffs features that have been added to Minecraft Bedrock. So of course I will only be covering the ones that were added to Minecraft Bedrock and potentially some technical applications because you know me, I generally look for technical applications. But yeah, let's look into all of this. So let's start with the most exciting addition. This is the Skulk sensor and I say most exciting but that is mostly because it was first seen at Minecon and well, that got a lot of people excited. What the Skulk sensor does is that it detects vibrations and then in turn gives redstone outputs. So it does make for some technically wireless redstone. If I walk here, it will detect the vibration from me walking. You can see how that is visualized through a little signal being sent there. And then it well powers that piston. It also gives out an update and the observer can detect that, as you can see here. Skulk sensors are still limited in functionality on better condition. There's a lot of things they don't detect. So they do detect walking. They also detect block placing. And they also detect block removing. But for some reason they do not detect when a piston gets moved. So that was lever placing. If I extend that piston, as you can see, Technically, you could say that the air box is being removed and a piston head is being placed, but it still does not trigger the skulk sensor. There's a few other things like projectiles and let's say a trident. I throw it on here. As you can see, it will trigger the skull sensor as well as the snowball. Regarding the projectiles though, it is pretty interesting because it doesn't matter where the projectile impacts and in fact it only matters where the player is. So you see this is the range of the skulk sensor. I visualized it by making a sphere shape and everything including those glass blocks are part of the detection range. So anything inside and including the glass blocks will be detected by the skulk sensor. So for a quick demonstration, you would probably think that when I shoot a trident inside here, it would be detected by the skulk sensor, right? However, let me do that. As you can see, it does not get detected by the skulk sensor. Okay, that was me walking. Let me do the same thing, but with myself inside of the range. And for some reason it works. Equally, you can also just be inside of the range and throw it outside of the range and as you can see it still triggers. So it appears that throwing projectiles, even when on the sound of impact, it does not actually react relative to the position of impact, but the position of where the player is. And I suppose that is a bug, I do not see much logic in that. Skulk sensors are also supposed to be not detecting any signals where there is wool, so that is supposed to be the wool occlusion feature, but that is obviously not a thing yet. Like I said, there's still a lot of things to add, and I really only want to show the other things that were added to Better Edition in the Caves and Close Beta. Well, technically not a full Caves and Close Beta, because as you can see in the top left corner it says 116, but yeah. As you can see, all around us there's already some things that are not in the Java Edition snapshots. Back to the Skulk sensor real quickly. It can be moved. In Java Edition it cannot be moved because, well, I believe it is a block entity. However, in better condition, any block entity can freely be moved, so the Skulk sensor can be moved as well. There is a bug with moving blocks that is due to a render dragon. Render Dragon is the new rendering engine that was introduced in the 1.16.200 update and it is quite buggy. Moving blocks are completely white 
And it just so happens that these little, I don't know, tentacles, I don't know what to call them, on top also flash white when moved. But yeah, you can move those indeed. What is interesting about moving skulk sensors is that when you move them and they are currently active, they will reset. So let me just activate it by standing on here. When I move it, it instantly resets. Now by using this, you can technically make fast skulk sensors that instantly reset. Well, I say instantly, but of course it still takes some time. So if I step on here, as you can see, it resets much faster than a normal skulk sensor would. So let me place a normal skulk sensor here in comparison. As you can see, that one reset much quicker than that one. And I'm not sure if there's any real good applications for this, but I do find it pretty interesting. Next up, the copper. Now copper is a new ore slash metal that is being added. It will not get any form of armor, but it does have various uses. This is the corresponding ore. It will also generate throughout the worlds, especially in the new caves that are not included in the better condition betas, by the way. And you can craft them into these blocks. And these blocks have some interesting properties, notably that they will weather over time. So this one will turn into this one and they will gradually transform until it arrives at the final stage. You can wax those copper blocks and they will be called wax, copper block, wax exposed, whatever. Weathered, you get the idea. The last one of course does not have a wax variant because it cannot go any further. And there is the same for all the stairs and slabs, etc. Copper can be crafted into a lightning rod and these lightning rods will attract lightning when there is a thunderstorm. That is quite interesting, but there's also something else we can do in better condition when there's a thunderstorm and we want lightning. We can put a channeling trident into a trident killer and that will automatically attract a lot of lightning. Of course, the lightning rod is the more official alternative, but I just wanted to point it out in the perspective of a technical player. In Java edition, there's also a spyglass you can craft from the copper. You can't get that right now. And of course, that spyglass also requires some of that amethyst crystal. I believe that's what it's called. And yeah, that is also not present in the better condition either at the moment. Because as you might have noticed, the Java edition team is currently developing the caves part of the caves and cliffs update. Whereas the better condition team is more focusing on the cliffs part of the update which is basically the mountains. Splitting the workload makes a lot of sense, and of course, for the final update, the caves will get ported to Bedrock, and the cliffs will get ported to Java. Next up, let's talk about another part of the caves part that was added to the Bedrock betas, but it's not currently naturally generating, and that is the stalactites and the stalagmites. Now, the stalactites and the stalagmites are these spike kind of things, they are called dripstone, however, but I do still call them stalactites and stalagmites because that's what they're called in real life. And, well, I guess it could be a little bit confusing for some people to remember which are the stalactites and the stalagmites. The stalagmites are these ones and the stalactites are the following ones. Let's get back to the point though. The stalactites or the stalagmites or rather the dripstone is so special because, well, it grows naturally. The logic behind that is that, of course, it amasses water in caves and it just grows, just like it is in real life. And, well, it does a lot of damage, and that in two forms. Notably, firstly, it amplifies fall damage. So this fall is 24 blocks. As you can see, the zombified piglet dies, and this one is 12 blocks. And he dies as well. Now, I believe that it just deals twice the damage. I'm not quite sure how exactly it works, but it does seem pretty logical. Plus, when you fall on them, you can hear the fall damage sound twice. In addition to that, you can also drop these pointed dripstones onto mobs, and you can deal massive amounts of damage. I believe it scales with how high they fall, and you can also stack multiple, like this. And yeah, it just deals a lot of damage. This could potentially be used for a Wither Killer, I believe, although I wouldn't really recommend it because it's not that great. But yeah, it is something that is there. However, something that I noticed that was different from Java Edition is that in the Java Edition, I do believe when you push 
one of these dripstone blocks, they just break. But in better condition, they actually turn into a moving block. And weird things like that happen. So yeah, that should probably be changed because it makes more sense that it breaks like, let's say, a plant would. Let's get a sapling, for example. That should be the easiest example. And yeah, they should break like that. That's the way I think would make most sense. Next up, let's take a look at the new-ish blocks, notably the powder snow. Now the powder snow is a bit unique of a block in that it can't really be mined in itself and picked up in the block form, but you get it in a powder snow bucket. So when you have a powder snow, you can pick it up with a bucket. Of course, I'm creative most, so I don't pick up anything, but you get a powder snow bucket when that is the case. Now you may be wondering, can you dispense it with a dispenser? No, unfortunately you cannot, it just drops the item like it would with any other item that cannot be dispensed, so that is quite unfortunate. Before I get into the technical applications of powder snow, which are very interesting, there are some properties to powder snow that you should know about, notably that you can actually freeze by going inside powder snow. Over time there will be a sort of freeze UI accumulating around your screen, which you can see right now, and in survival mode you will take freeze damage, so that is not that great of course when you are inside. However, you can wear leather boots, I'm not sure if it was other leather armor as well, but with leather boots I believe it is negated, maybe it is only midgetated, I'm not sure if it's completely negated. However, Powder Snow has a, another interesting property, and that is you normally sink in when you walk on it. And that is actually quite interesting, because it can be used for mob forms. I'll get into that later. Hey, future Navy Nexus here. I didn't actually end up addressing it after all, but basically mobs pathfind over Powder Snow and they end up falling through, so this can technically be used for mob forms. However, the mobs kind of fall very slowly through the powder snow, so it's a lot better to use trapdoors or even coral fans after all. But you do actually sink in. You can climb up if you try hard enough, I believe, but when you have leather boots, you can just straight up stand on top of it. Let's quickly get into the technical applications of powder snow. Now, powder snow is very interesting because, unlike on the Java edition, it can be moved on the better condition. And that already makes it a very interesting block, because it does not really have a collision box. Of course, it slows you down, but it does not have any hard collisions. But despite that, you can move it completely fine. So it is sort of similar to Cobweb, except it restricts you way less, and you can move it. Additionally, Powder Snow is a block through which you can read signals with a comparator. As you can see, when I put an item in that chest, the comparator is able to read through the powder snow. And this makes for some very interesting applications in storage tech, because of course in storage tech you want to compact things a lot, and when you have a block like that, that does not have a collision box, which means items could potentially fall through, you can potentially save a lot of space by using that block and having a comparator be able to read through it, and items fall through it, and it being movable all at the same time, I'm pretty sure it could be used for some useful things like, let's say, shulk loaders or unloaders, all of that kind of stuff, we will see. To some extent, it was also theorized that powder snow in particular could be made use of for translocation elevators, and well, just translocation general, we can demonstrate that real quick. As you can see, the mob gets moved upwards, but I'm not quite sure if that still only applies to Powder Snow, because you can use other blocks as well, and you see that that works just fine. Now, whether the Powder Snow has any additional properties that make translocation with it more convenient than with other blocks, I'm not quite sure of it, I have not done the testing, but if you want to do some testing on it yourself, well, go ahead, and if you have any interesting results, might as well share it in the comments. One last thing I want to mention about the powder snow is that it is supposed to be farmable. Now in the Java edition, the powder snow will form in cauldrons when it is snowing and the cauldron is under an open sky when it is snowing of course. And when it is full you can collect it with a bucket and you get a powder snow bucket. And yeah, that is also one additional way you can farm it. 
Let's move on to the mobs that have already been added in this update. And first, let's start with the goat. Now, the goat is not that useful of a mob. All of the more recent mob additions haven't all been really that useful, but it doesn't really matter much. I suppose they jump. And there's also a mechanic that these goats will try to ram into other mobs. And I believe when they accidentally ram into a tree trunk, they will drop a goat horn. Now a goat horn does not do much at the moment, except when you hold it, it will start, well, doing a horn sound. Right now it is using the eating animation, which is a bit strange. But as you can see, it's, oh well, as you can hear, it does the sound of a raid horn, and it is quite interesting. It'll probably get some other use later on, I know that is very loud, but for now we have to sit tight. The second more controversial mob that has been added is the Glow Squid. Now, the Glow Squid is the winner of the mob vote of the past Minecon, and I think it is pretty neat. I can see how some people would be upset that it got voted in over the Iceologer or the, I don't know, Shroom something, I don't remember what it was but it does have some interesting items that were added along with it. The gloss squid itself is not that interesting. It is a squid that glows. That is very, very surprising, am I right? And if I set the time to midnight, as you can see, they do glow in the dark. Hence the name glow squid. Very, very interesting. Well, not really. Let's carry on with the glow squid related items. Now the glow squid related items are, well, is the glow ink sack, and there also is the glow item frame. Now the glow item frame will glow up any item that is inside of it. I set the time to night. Let's place a glow item frame and a normal item frame side by side. You can already see how that one is lighter. And yeah, this one does glow, whereas this one does not. However, the glow ink sack also has some other uses, along with some changes to signs that were in the Java edition for a few updates now. So I'm just going to set time to noon, and let's take a look. So I'm just going to type some stuff, and when I use, let's say, a red dye, surprise, surprise, well, it's meant to be red, but you don't really see it that much. I suppose it is a side effect of the glow ink sack edition and yeah it is very pale normally it's supposed to look like this but this is with the glow ink sack now what the glow ink sack does when you use it on a sign is that the text glows up at night just like the glow item frame and you can also remove that effect by using a normal ink sack on the sign again now like you saw you can dye text by using a dye and clicking on this sign and the text will be dyed to the appropriate color. Now you may wonder how I have different colors on this sign, and that is because Minecraft has text formatting. So if I use this, this is just a sign that I have on my keyboard. I believe you need to make some sort of wonky Unicode combination if you do not have a German keyboard like I do, or well, a keyboard that has it. I'm not saying only German keyboards have it. But yeah, essentially you have this symbol and some letters and it makes various things. So for example, this makes bold text. There's also the symbol and E which does yellow text. Actually, there's lots of lots of lots of these. You can find these on the wiki. This does not work on the Java edition. So it's kind of weird that both this system and the dying system now works on the better edition and they do kind of interfere. Not only that, but the dying system and the glow ink sack system do interfere as well, because obviously when you dye text red, it should not look as pale as that, or well, dark. And yeah, it seems like the glow effect is interfering. It's strange, but we'll probably see it fixed in the future. Before we get to the big feature, which is the mountains and some changes to world generation, let's just take a look at the new ore textures from Jappa. So I've been following his progress on Twitter for quite a while. And yeah, he's making changes and gradually adjusts the ore textures. And you might think, well, that's blasphemy. They are iconic. Why change them? It does make sense because having different shapes helps colorblind people distinguish the ores. 
they are keeping the diamond ore the same because the diamond ore is absolutely iconic and I agree that that was a good choice. But some of the other ores do look really nice with their new texture. So I really like the emerald one, the other ones are okay. I really don't like the iron one for now, but you know, it's still work in progress. None of these are final. Now that we got everything else out of the way, excluding the Java edition, Caves and Cliffs features that I'm not covering because my channel is mostly focused on better condition. Let's take a look at the big obvious change, which is the mountains generation. Now the mountains generation actually has some very interesting things. Notably, with the introduction of this mountains biome, they are also introducing vertical biomes or 3D biomes, however you may call it. That is something that was introduced in the Java edition in the 1.16 update, that's the nether update. You may not know about it, but in the Java edition, especially in the nether, or well only in the nether for now, there are biomes that are vertically independent. So on older versions before 1.16 on Java edition, biomes were always 1x and z coordinates. And that would always mean that let's say this block is a mountains biome. Or when you're in a desert, this one block or this column is a desert biome. This does not necessarily apply anymore because now biomes can be vertically independent. So that means at this height it could be a mountain biome. But when I go deeper it is a caves biome or this or that. You get the idea. Anyway, there's not too much I could tell you about the specifics of the generation of these mountains. I am not adept at reading code, nor do I really have any experience with it. But what I do know from just playing around with it is that, first of all, they look pretty amazing. I think they could still use some tweaking, but it is just a fantastic landscape when you encounter one. They're also quite rare. This is a seed that I found from a Minecraft dev on Twitter. And something else interesting is that you will find lots of emerald ore over here. So you know how there is increased amounts of emerald ore, or well, only emerald ore in extreme hills? Well, they're taking it to the next level here, because this is more extreme than extreme. And it does make sense that you would find emerald in such an environment. But they are to be found in lots of places, and I think that is a very good way to make the mountains biomes more appealing. Let's just read through what King Bedox has explained, and he is a Minecraft gameplay developer. So what he is saying is that the mountains biomes have four different layers. It starts with the mountain meadows, it continues with the mountain groove, or grove, I don't really know how to pronounce that. There's the snowy slopes, and then it's either the lofty peaks or the snow-capped peaks, and it varies between the temperature of either of those. And all of that depends on the height. So all of that's very interesting, and you should get the idea of how these different biomes end up working. You might have been noticing this on the top left corner, where my coordinates are. And there are lots of blocks here that are above the conventional build height limit, which used to be 256 blocks. But just like in the Java edition, it was raised to 320 blocks. So I can actually build much higher than 256, and this does have some implications for a technical Minecraft. Now one notable implication for that is that, oh god, yeah, it really easily fills up the chat when you hold, you don't actually need to press repeatedly. But what I'm trying to say here is that when you have more vertical space, you can make some mob forms easier by just AFKing higher. And previously with the 256 block build limit, it would be a little bit harder. Because when you are on the simulation range or simulation distance of 6 and higher, the spawn sphere is 128 blocks radius. So that means you would ideally be 128 blocks above an ocean or, well, a flat surface. An ocean is the most ideal for that. And sea level is around Y64. So when you take that up by 128 blocks, you would end up around Y200, maybe a little lower, but that already does not leave you much headroom over your head, and usually that's where you want to stack a lot of layers, because there are specific mob farm layouts that really want you to build mob farm layers right above your head, 
and also in other specific locations. It is called a split density layout. I will not go into too much detail that here. I'll probably make a farm using it later and also credit the appropriate people. But the basics of that is just that with the increased build height limit, you can also fit more layers and that means increased rates for mob forms. So that is a very nice side effect. In the Java edition, the build limit was raised both from the bottom and from the top. So in the Java edition, the total range of where you can build is not from 0 to 320, like right now in the Bedrock edition, but from minus 64 to 320 for a total of 384 available blocks to build in in a given XZ coordinate. And well, you know, that is because the cave update is going to need a lot more depth. But right now they have not done that on the better condition. Now I think there's a good reason for that. And that is currently that when you add more, well, blocks underneath the build limits, then all of the sub chunks get shifted down. What this means is that instead of there being an empty space underneath the already existing, well, chunks and all the blocks that are there, all of the blocks would get moved down. This is something that can probably be fixed. And the reason why I know this is because my good friend Rufus Atticus did some modding and he changed the build limit himself. And when he changed it via hex editing, it did exactly that. All of the sub chunks were moved down. So I assume that's why they haven't just instantly done it right now, but obviously they will do it later on. And no, it is very unlikely that your existing worlds will be messed up by all of the sub chunks just moving down. All right, that about covers everything that I wanted to cover. I may have forgotten some things. And of course, if you find more interesting technical applications for any of the new features that were added or well, that are going to be added in the Caves and Clothes update, then well, let me know in the comments. And also let me know if I forgot anything, I can always include it in a pinned comment. That being said, thank you very much for watching and well, I will see you around. Bye.